Well, it's three minutes past, so perhaps we should start. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, friends and colleagues. Welcome. Welcome to SOAS. Unfortunately, we couldn't meet in person this evening, and we decided to move this evening event online. This is another one in our contemporary artist talk series. Uh, we've had a few of these. The one we had last year this time, almost exactly the same day, I think, um, was a feature of the work of another West African artist, Ya Owusu. So we're staying in West Africa this week, this, um, this week um, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, our distinguished guests um, and artists at this evening's event. Today we're featuring uh, the work of Arthur Timothy, who was born in Accra in Ghana, uh, who will be speaking to us about his latest exhibition, Postcards from a Promised Land, with reference to Sierra Leone. Um, uh, welcome, Timothy. Thank you very much uh, for coming and speaking to us this evening. Uh, Timothy will be in conversation with another West African artist, uh, Hassan Alui, who is a British Nigerian artist. Welcome, uh, Hassan. Thank you very much for coming. Our uh, chair this evening is Khadija George Sese. Uh, Khadija is a literary activist who has published uh, widely on West African uh, sort of uh, literature, literary uh, affairs. Uh, Khadija will be uh, with us today, mainly as a chair, but also as a, a part, part, particip part participant in uh, this conversation, discussion we're having this evening. Thank you very much, Khadija, welcome. Uh, and very, a very warm welcome to our online audience. Um, Khadija will say uh, a bit more about uh, the gallery that we are in association with this evening, Gallery 1957. Um, this is a webinar, so um, please feel free to our online audience, please feel free to participate in the discussion via the um, so Q&A uh, facility. Uh, but Khadija will say more about that too. So thank you very much. And I'll, I'll hand us over to Khadija. Thanks, Khadija. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dooling. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. It's like a great honor to chair this um, event this evening. And um, and as, as the weather has driven us to online, so, uh, such as life, we'll just have a, a conversation flow in the warmth. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to... Um, introduce you to Arthur Timothy and Hassan Aliyu this evening. But before I forget, we will be, let me just give you the format. We are going to be, well, they're going to be more like in conversation for about 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. And, um, but we will be taking questions from you. And so any questions that you have, please put them in the Q and A. And that's where we'll pick up the questions from. But if you've got any information, that you want to share that is useful, please put that in the chat and so that everybody can share on that information as well. And we will keep that. I'd like to thank SOAS very much for hosting this too. It's, it's really great to be part of this series um, and, and to have this, this conversation, to have this conversation here. Um, yeah, and so the information, I'm gonna give very brief bios because as where, where you signed on, you can see the, the bios of, of both artists. So um, I won't have to, to go into that. I'd rather just get into the conversation and just take it from there. So yeah, so first of all, we have, as I said, Arthur Timothy and I'm involved because I was very lucky I, to be able to write the text for his catalog that will be coming out in January. The exhibition is until the 28th of January at Gallery 1957 at Hyde Park Gate. And so there are actually, the 1957 Gallery actually opened up in Accra in Ghana, and that now goes across four spaces, including, can you believe it, artist residential space, which is such a precious thing to have. All artists, no matter what uh, genre you're working in, that's a precious thing to have. And now they have their gallery as well in London, as well as sponsoring the Ya Asantwa Prize for women artists who work in Africa. So please go online to check all of that out. I'll put links into the chat for people to follow up on that. So I'm just going to open really with asking two very 
a, a couple of broad questions to both of you. But first of all, since the exhibition just opened up last week and, um, and I invited Hassan to, to attend that, Hassan, what were your impressions? What can people expect after the snow and they get to go to the exhibition? What can they expect? Well, it was um, a fair trek from uh, the nearest train station walking through uh, Hyde Park. And I'd never been to Gallery 1957 before. But when I got there, what I found was just so breathtaking. Uh, the exhibition opened up with a number of portrait paintings of some very happy young people. I wondered who these people were. And in fact, in the four years, you go into the main galleries, you know, confronted with such pleasantly painted, beautiful faces of African children. Um, I presumed that it was going to be predominantly a portrait based exhibition. So you can imagine my awe when I went into the main gallery and I saw these very huge, large paintings curated very, very close to one another. So quite tightly packed into the room. However, the effect was not claustrophobic. The effect was very airy because of the very soft, light, beautiful touch, this wonderful technique of painting that Arthur has. In the third gallery was a triptych, which is measures about six um, meters uh, wide by just under two meters high. And as massive as that painting was, immersive as it was, it was not dominating. It didn't take over your spirit or make the room look small. As a matter of fact, it made the room look very, very big. It was a very enjoyable exhibition for a person who moved away from figuration for as long ago as I have. And I would urge that everybody goes down to see the exhibition. I've got some snippets in a PowerPoint presentation which I've put together that should give you a taste of what you've got to see when you get to the Gallery 1957 after this note. So I've got to chuck in there before I move over to Arthur to just talk about how he started getting started painting. Part of that wonderful experience you had I and mean, like you say, people don't always think about the curation. They, you know, they're going in to look at the work. Your entry into the gallery, and as you say, first of all, you have the portraiture of the children and then we're moving into the space. I think we really have to thank Arthur's wife, Erica, for putting that plan together so efficiently in terms of his work and the space. So Yes, exactly. We have to that was very well curated for the space yes. because also given the scale of that work and mm -hmm. the depth of the work we the four years going to the gallery, that was mm -hmm. the best place to have them. But it ushered you in. You knew you were coming to see a happy exhibition, right? It wasn't troubling, but then there was aspects of the Sierra Leonean experience, which then I am looking for in the exhibition, which I'd like to discuss further with Arthur during the course of our conversation. Okay. Before you do that, I'd just like Arthur to maybe talk about his, I didn't even, I know I said I was going to give you brief introductions, but I literally gave you none, who is also an architect. <laughs> he's an architect, so he's, a, he's always been an artist, really then, um, uh, an architect um, and an artist. And I'm, you know, I was just assuming that so many people knew, knew Hassan, that I didn't introduce him very well, but please go and look at his very experienced biography on the website um, in terms of um, the SOAS web, and then you can see why I asked him to come in and have this conversation with Arthur. So Arthur, please, can you just tell us a little bit about how you became more involved now, more with visual art than the architectural side of your work? Uh, sure. Um, actually, first of all, <laughs> if I could just thank Hassan for that um, uh, really nice uh, introduction about the um, exhibition. Um, and uh, I actually like to say that uh, in looking at Hassan's work, I mean, he, he, is, um, he is much more of an artist than I, I think I am, because um, for me, uh, art is something that I've only recently um, started doing. Um, I've been an architect um, for a very long time. Um, I used to have mentioned earlier, I trained for seven years to be an architect, uh, but I always used to, um, paint and draw as a hobby. Uh, and it was something that I normally did at weekends. Um, and uh, what happened was that um, my son Duval um, made a stretched a canvas and gave it to me one Christmas as a Christmas present. And um, so I had 
because it was a present from him, I had to, um, I had to do something. Uh, so I had this canvas on an easel in my office for three months before I actually started working on it. Um, eventually I started painting. Um, I went on to finish one painting. Then um, I sort of grew in confidence and I did another one. And when that uh, painting was finished, uh, my wife Erica suggested that um, I should put them in for the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy. Um, we, we did that and um, fortunately or miraculously, both of them got accepted. And then um, uh, I was approached by a number of people who asked if they um, could buy the paintings and I um, said that they were not for sale. Um, and then I was approached by another gentleman who um, asked if I would be interested in having an exhibition in a gallery in um, Mayfair, which was the Ronchini Gallery. So I was very excited about that prospect and um, uh, agreed to do, uh, I think it was eight paintings for, for that exhibition. Um, and so the, really that's, that's how I started it. It's really um, accidental. It wasn't something that I expected. Um, it just really, came out of nowhere really. That must be such a thrill though, when somebody says to you, please, <laughs> you know, we'd like to show your work. In uh, it was, in it, it, it was, it was, uh, it was really nice. I mean, I, I uh, it, it's, uh, you know, sometimes um, if, if you feel that there's something that you can do and, and, and you're not doing it, I think it kind of upsets your, um, your, your sort of life balance. Um, and um, I think this is why my son, I think my son Duval knew that um, I, I was interested in art and that um, I was slightly frustrated. Um, um, so I would say that, I, I would imagine that this history, which is fairly recent, you know, when Duval gave you this canvas in 2018, which is only very recently, yeah. I am sure that in your years while you were growing up, where you are going to school, you would have excelled in class as perhaps the best artist in your class. So you'd have already known that you have the flair and the knack for, you know, doing this without too much effort. Um, yes, I, I, I'm not going to be modest here. <laughs> yes, I did. I, I've always known that, um, I, and you're right, um, from a very young age, I, I was good at drawing. Um, yeah. And um, I, I always knew that I could do it. But, exactly. Um, we always know from childhood. Yes. We always know that that's the one thing that we do. In fact, I'm sure in your time as well as in mine, your time was before mine, obviously. Our parents, my parents tried to dissuade me from doing that because I did that too much to the detriment of everything else. I spent much more time sketching and drawing than I spent doing my math or my science. And then in Africa, those, the art, the sketching, drawing and making art, making paintings was not deemed to be um, uh, you know, an acceptable, acceptable career for uh, one's, you know, child to want to pursue as such in the 70s, 60s, I, I would imagine, 80s. Yes, you're right. I actually remember um, a conversation with my late father um, when I was, um, before going to university, and I was, um, I was interested in, I mean, by that time, I was interested in architecture, but I was also interested in art and, and actually history as well. And um, when we discussed art, he um, sort of looked at me and um, said that he did not think that this would be um, a way that I could um, sort of make a living. Uh, and he felt, he felt that architecture was actually the best combination of um, the skills or the talents I had. Um, so yes, I think he, he sort of encouraged me into that. I'm going to show a few slides of your work and particularly just to give the audience um, online an impression of what we're talking about, because it's so very difficult to talk about art in absentia. So at least they'll see the whole, you are a very people person. Family is extremely important to you. That comes across in everything you've said to me ever since this first minute I met you. I knew your children's name before I even saw them at the gallery, right? I know what part Erica plays in your, in your work. And, you know, it's just such a beautiful thing. And then also your work is so figurative and most of these figures that you represent are people who are connected to you in one way or another. So let's have a look at some of this work just to give people 
an idea of what there is that we're talking about. Um, the first slide I'm going to show is the piece that got it all started, at least professionally, from the um, Real Academy's summer exhibition. So bear with me, let me try and work this um, PowerPoint and then I can be on slideshow and play from current. Okay, so that's the piece, the second figure from the left being your mother. Uh, from, from, the, from the right, thank you, Hassan. I beg your pardon, from yeah. the right, being your mother. And um, so this is a piece that you painted on the canvas that Duval gave to you in 2018, which had yes. sat in your office for a while. Yes. Um, tell us about this piece and about your figuration generally, please. Yes, um, this, um, uh, this, this is of uh, my mother and actually a friend of hers and uh, two cousins um, who are twins. Um, on either side, um, called mm -hmm. Ivy and Iva Johnson, and um, they were they were going or I, I, sorry they just arrived I think uh, at, for a reception a party, and um, I was really interested in this because uh, it was from a black and white photograph that I had, and they were wearing um, these wonderful dresses and my mother was a dressmaker, and. Um, the dress that my mother was wearing, although it was black and white, I actually remember the color, the colors in that dress, because um, my brother and I, when we were young, we used to sit with my mother in her studio when she was making uh, clothes for her clients and so on. And um, but I remember this particular fabric, so for me it was actually quite easy to um, to put color to it, um, and I. I just really liked um, the image of um, four very confident, well-dressed uh, women who um, were just out to enjoy themselves. And um, I, I just really wanted to try and sort of convey, convey that, actually. And no doubt this picture was taken in the 50s or the 60s? In the 60s. This one was 60s. This one was 60s, yeah. And then um, the choice of the background color also, it's um, the, the contrast between the color of the um, central figures in the painting and the background and then the foreground, the deep crimson of the ground there, the contrast there sort of yeah. accentuates these forms very beautifully. Um, no doubt, these weren't the actual colors in the picture from which you painted, but these are pictures, these are colors that you have introduced as a result of a very thorough and really good high level understanding of the impacts of color. Um, yes, I, thank you um, for saying that, Hassan. I mean, I, I think um, a lot of it actually came about with um, experimentation and, um, you know, uh, somehow instinctively, you know, when something, something is working. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, 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 I did experiment and then I got to this, um, to these particular uh, colors, which I think worked very well and seemed to bring the figures um, forward um, and also ground them. Yes, amazing. And um, your first solo exhibition in Ghana was last year at the Gallery 1957, and it was titled Grandma's House, which was curated by the uh, celebrated curator Echo Eshan, who's recently done um, in the Black Fantastic at the Hayward Gallery. Um, yeah. How was the experience of working with him? Uh, it, it was it was it was great. I mean, um, it, j just just to correct you, Hassan, it was, the exhibition was called Grandma's Hands. Um, I beg your pardon. No, 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 sorry. No, but um, but w working um, with, with Echo was was great, and um, you know, I think he really understood what I was um, uh, what, what I was trying to do with the um, exhibition, and also looking at uh, it was really. Um, uh, a question of sort of, I was trying to look at my, my family. I have a Ghanaian side of my family and uh, the Sierra Leonean side um, and uh, their history. Um, and also during the colonial period, um, you know, what was going on in, um, in Ghana um, and uh, just sort of really, um, because I, 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 I mean, I, I did not find that there were very many images. So I'm not sure people are actually aware of what society was like at that time. 
um, you know, the whole thing, the history of Ghana um, and, uh, and under Nkrumah and the way that Ghana was really, I mean, in some ways, I think Ghana was actually, well, it was leading the, the rest of Africa um, and um, was a very, very important, um, important uh, example. So I, I kind of wanted to bring that out. Okay, since we're on Ghana, I might as well continue on the Ghana as a, as a uh, discussion point. Um, this here is a portrait of your father and your mother. Your father was a journalist. At this time, he worked in Ghana. Is that correct? This yes. is one of the pieces, one of two pieces that you showed, which was selected for the Real Academy's summer exhibition, uh, which you were offered a purchase, which you declined, and subsequently an exhibition came out of it. Um, yes. But tell me about this painting in terms of that story which we discussed earlier on about why you left Ghana to go back to Sierra Leone or to go to Sierra Leone. Okay, yes. Well, well, my, my father, um, it, 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 you see, uh, there's a very interesting history to this because um, I told this story to Khadija um, before because um, my grandmother brought my, she raised my father on her own. And... Uh, my grandmother ran a, a bakery, which was near her house. Um, she built this house by herself. And she, um, she was able to send my father to come to study in England um, at that time, um, which was a, a, you know, a big deal for a single woman. Um, and my father originally came to England and he was going to study dentistry. But when he got here, he decided that um, he was more interested in um, journalism. He wanted to be a journalist. So he, he didn't actually tell my grandmother, but he, um, because she'd sacrificed so much to get him here. And um, uh, I think, you know, he, he actually became a journalist. Uh, and um, it was later on when he was doing well that he actually told my grandmother. Um, and she was, she was, uh, how should I say? I was gonna say happy, but I think she was pacified because um, he was doing quite well for himself. So her sacrifice hadn't been in vain. Um, anyway, subsequently, he, he actually, um, he was the first black journalist to work on Fleet Street. Um, he worked for the Daily Express, um, uh, which was owned by this chap, um, Lord Beaverbrook. And um, later on, uh, they sent him to uh, Ghana because, um, they owned a newspaper. In fact, I think it was a, another press baron called um, Cecil King who owned um, the Daily Graphic. So my father was sent there and um, became the editor. And he was very, um, I mean, he was, he was a Pan-Africanist. He was, he was really um, delighted um, about what was going on in Ghana. Um, he, he was, very happy initially with what Nkrumah was doing, but as Nkrumah um, became more, um, uh, how can you say, um, it's a word autocratic perhaps. Um, my, my, my father, yeah, he was very critical. Um, and through his articles, he became more and more critical of uh, Nkrumah and what Nkrumah was doing in Ghana. And um, there was one particular article he wrote, which was the title of which was, um, what, what next Kwame, which particularly incensed Nkrumah. And as a result of that, um, uh, my father was deported with a couple of other people by Nkrumah. And, um, and he said that he was deporting him um, because his presence was not conducive to the public good. So um, <laughs> as a Sierra Leonean, of course, um, being in Ghana, so it was easy for my father to go to Sierra Leone. And um, we, we went there and um, lived there subsequently. But this particular um, painting for me, um, I think I, 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 it, it sort of shows my, I, obviously I didn't see my father or my mother like this, but um, when I found the image, um, it, it, to me, it kind of um, typical, uh, or sorry, they resonated with my father's kind of, um, that there was a kind of, um, uh, how can I say? Uh, uh, he had a certain fearlessness. Um, and to me, it came through in this image. Um, and my mother, um, as a dressmaker, 
you know, the dress that she was wearing was really beautiful. And um, so, yeah, I, I um, it, yeah, it sort of resonated for me somehow. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful painting. Um, some of the issues that um, led to your father's deportation are issues that occurred more than once in, in yeah. Ghana. And um, I know that in 1971, uh, the Nigerians who were living in Ghana were deported without the benefit of uh, taking along uh, their wherewithal, uh, their businesses yeah. or, or their cars or their property uh, were yes. confiscated by the Ghanaian government. And then subsequently in 1979, Nigeria re re um, retaliated by uh, deporting Ghanaians Course, in mass, you know, from from Nigeria, which again, for me now in my current awareness, I mm. find really difficult to um, sort of uh, reconcile with Pan Africanism. Mm. So yes. we are simply sort of um, enforcing those colonial borders, you know, amongst a people who we are, on the other hand, trying to, you know, sort of um, advocate oneness for. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So yeah. it's kind of a contradiction, but it's a nice story um, to, mm. to know, you know, that uh, Nkrumah would have done a thing like that, but I suppose yes. power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So that could mm. have been one of the manifestations of, 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 that, um, of that statement. Um, yes. But let's look at the painting of your mother's, your grandmother's house, which is where, um, which shows, you know, celebrates her life and perhaps says about her achievement as a uh, single woman who was able to um, send her son to study in England in the 50s. Um, so this one is part of the exhibition, right? Just to let people yes, know. Yes, this is in the exhibition. This is in the exhibition. <laughs> Thank you, pardon. I'm having a bit of a play from current. Okay, so that painting. So that's a really, so sort of affluent looking house in the middle of uh, less affluent surroundings with um, the contradiction of a um, corrugated sheep hoarding, perhaps maybe a dilapidated or collapsing building right next door to um, this really sort of stately home, if you like. Um, we find a lot of such contradictions in Nigeria, so I'm sure that you do too in, in, in Sierra Leone. Absolutely, um, yes. So, yeah. Um, tell us about this painting. Was your focus on the house or on the foregrounded um, figures in, you know, the various daily yeah. grind? I, I, I think that my, my focus was really on, on the figures, on, on just um, the life of the street. Um, but also, I, in, in the time I spent in Sierra Leone and going back on holidays, um, this particular spot is where um, my, my brother and I used to hang out with friends. Um, on, on the left-hand side, beyond the picture, um, my grandmother, my grandmother had two brothers. Um, uh, Grandpa Thomas lived on this side on the left and um, another uh, brother who, whose name was Eku, lived on the right. Um, so uh, we, we, for me, when I was doing this, actually, all these memories um, were just coming, coming back. Um, and, but really, it's, it's really about the street life, you know, the noises, people going by, the hustle and bustle of everyday life. Yeah. Um, and the house is really a backdrop. But sure. for the house, um, I, um, on, the, on the lower level, um, at the side by where the figures are. Um, that is where my mother had her um, dressmaking studio uh, when, when we were little. And, um, uh, and we lived um, upstairs after we, my family came back from Ghana and my grandmother was, was downstairs. Um, but but it, it's all, it, it's quite, I mean, it, to me, honestly, it's uh, in a way, it's a bit like, um, therapy because when I was uh, painting uh, this picture and others, um, I was just really taken back. Um, and, and it was a very, yeah, very pleasant experience. So can you tell us a bit more about that therapy? How was it therapeutic? Is it therapeutic um, it, because you, the reality you see in the, in the town, right? And then the art as a form of escape from that reality, translating that reality to a beautiful painting? Is that the therapy? Uh, 
No, I think for, for me, the, the, the therapy was actually in just bringing back the, um, the, um, the good times that we had um, while we were growing up there. Um, and um, yeah, just remembering the people uh, and the place. When when did you um, when did you come to the UK? When did you come to London? Uh, we we came here in uh, April nineteen sixty six. Um, yeah. You're about ten years old then. I was nine. Nine. Yeah. And um, we um, we came by a passenger ship, which was called the MV Oriel. Oh. <laughs> did you know yes. it? Of okay. course I did. Yes, <laughs> yes of course, <laughs> because there were. <laughs> It was the. It sailed uh, all of West Africa, so it's right. our equivalent of the Windrush. Yes. So it brought. Yeah. The, that's yeah. right. Okay. Um, yes, sorry, and yes. It was owned by um, Elder Dempster Lines. That's right. Uh, yes. It, there was also the um, the Oriel. There was the Apapa, wasn't there? And that's right. Another, another one, and the journey took us nine days, um, mm -hmm. and we stopped off at Las Palmas yes. on the way, and then I remember going through the Bay of Biscay, which was so rough people were just being sick over the sides of the of the boat and so on but um and uh we arrived um and my father came to meet us i, I remember him turning up with this big heavy coat a scarf and a big sort of trilby hat and um i remember the cold and we went straight down to london where he lived and um uh, and it, it was, um, I mean, subsequently we, I mean, London was really um, uh, buzzing because we, we were very central. My father lived in Bayswater and he had a nice place there. And um, so, and we were just by Hyde Park. So we, my, my brother and I had a really nice time. So at that very time, I was getting deported. Well, not deported, I was getting um, taken back to Nigeria because in those days, in the 60s, when I was born, the day we came from hospital was the day that our landlady threw us out of the house. And I haven't tried to find foster care for myself and my twin sister. And without much luck, as a matter of fact, the foster parent then going to get caught for shoplifting. Um, the only option was to send us back to Nigeria. So while you were coming to the UK and having that experience and those memories, those enchanting experiences of Sierra Leone, we were just going back to UK, Nigeria to face a different kind of life entirely. Gosh, um, yeah. So there's two different stories to the black experience of the 60s. Yeah. And I think your story is a privileged um, experience. And so, um, mm. but that said, I think if we look at some of those portraits, um, which I said earlier as you enter your exhibition, those portraits, I would imagine that when you came here as a nine-year-old, you'd be thinking about some of the friends you had as at that time. So yeah. the sense of nostalgia is very well established and entrenched, especially being in a foreign land where suddenly from seeing giggly, happy faces with no hair and no clothes, not a lot of money, but happy all day long to coming here and it's completely different culture shock, possibly. Mm. That's yeah. me concluding maybe prematurely. So correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, no. I, 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 think, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go to those portraits because this really sort of helps me sort of see a perspective to why these works are even more important than I thought originally as part of your practice. So these are, you know, children in the neighborhood. Um, please tell us your relationship to them. I know that some of them were like family in the sense that they grew up with your grandmother and all that yes well they they um they actually they they live in in the house that was my grandmother's house and um my um second son duval um it now has now taken on the house and so he spends um a part of each year uh living living at the house and um uh, these are the grandchildren. I mentioned earlier on that my grandmother, uh, a lady called um, Virginia, um, and these are actually Virginia's grandchildren. Um, and Virginia's children are, uh, they're younger than, younger than me, but um, 
there are two boys, um, Omolari and Elkana, and um, these are Elkana's children. And so every time we go back, you know, we see them and um, we, we, we are really family. Um, and uh, they, they, still, they still live there. Beautiful. And who is this beauty? <laughs> this, this is Harriet, actually. And um, interestingly enough, um, Harriet was actually named after my grandmother. Um, and uh, she, she um, you know, I, I just look at, looking at her image, she, she's, um, she was a very cheeky um, uh, sort of impish um, little girl. And um, yeah. so, uh, you know, she, she's now, she's now grown up, but um, th this was an image of her on one of our holidays back. Uh -huh. and, uh, um, and and this is Sydney and um, and Valentine, Daniel. Daniel, sorry, Daniel and Valentine. Um, mm -hmm. And um, Daniel was trying not to smile. He was trying to keep a very straight face. Yeah. And of course, um, Sydney behind was trying to make him make him laugh. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, beautiful. But, uh, um, and uh, this is Ruth, and um, uh, Ruth lived at my mother's house. My mother's house was actually further away. Um, and um, whereas my grandmother's house was right in the center of town. Um, uh, this is a, a portrait of Harriet um, when she's uh, older and she was attending the Annie Walsh um, girls school. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it is a very famous school, actually. I think it's the oldest, um, I think it's actually the oldest um, girls school in West Africa. Um, is it older than Fura Bay? Is it, Bay um, is it? I think, I think, I'm not sure. Yeah, Fura Bay is the, the oldest university in West Africa, but I think that Annie War School is it's probably either the same age or it might be even older. Um, oh, okay. And interestingly enough, my... Um, I think it is my, older, just to mention, older, I think it is older, and I, I, and I put it in some of the information that I had about this ah. image, and I sent it to a Sierra Leonean, and he said, it's not possibly Khadija, it's definitely the oldest one in West Africa. Oh, wow. There we have it, from an expert. It's definitely <laughs> yeah. the oldest in West Africa, uh, the oldest girls' school, yeah, exactly. girls' secondary mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. and, and it has a wonderful tradition, and in, in fact, my... Um, my late mother and her sisters were all educated at um, Annie oh, Walsh. So um, her father in Ghana sent them all over to Australia to be educated. And who are these? Paddy Paddy, that's friends. Paddy Paddy, Paddy, yeah. <laughs> Paddy that's friends, yeah. Um, on, on, on the, on the, it, it's um, Harriet on the right, when she was little, and, and a friend of hers who would come to play. Um, and this was at my, my mother's house. Um, just on the um, on the veranda, um, and uh, I think well, I hope it just captures the sort of innocence of of youth. And, yeah, um, it's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, um, these two children, we we went up to the provinces, um, and um, we stopped at a village on the way to a place called uh, Robonko. And um, uh, these two children were amongst others who um, stopped to say hello to us and so on. But um, the, there, was something, there was something about the image of them that, um, we, that really touched, touched us. And I, 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 I kind of felt that they, they seem to have a kind of um, uh, certain wisdom that is beyond, beyond their year, years, the way they, they were sort of looking. And I, so I was trying to capture that. Um, uh, yeah, that time. very beautifully captured. And my question here now becomes, how did you feel when suddenly these children became victims of a brutal war where they were totally, you know, impossible to hurt anybody yet they were getting their limbs chopped off, amputated during the wars? How did I, you feel? Uh, uh, horrified um, uh, and, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's something that um, had never happened. And, and I think that actually people just could not believe that such horror could be happening uh, in Sierra Leone and they could not understand where, where this um, 
came from. Um, and I mean, obviously, we we found out that it started in Liberia under Charles Taylor, the then president, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know wanting to, and that it was fueled by wanting to get the diamond mines and and and, and so forth. But the actual way in which um, uh, the uh, rebel war um, was carried out and the the atrocities that the soldiers committed, um, I think to this day is still something that is very hard to come to terms with. Um, on, on subsequent visits to Sierra Leone, you know, we, we would, um, cousins would point out um, people who were um, ex, you know, combatants who, who had actually committed terrible atrocities themselves during the war. But somehow, um, and I still don't understand this, but, but people were actually willing to kind of forgive and move on with their lives. I, I, I met someone who had had a, a, a leg amputated during the war. And um, um, my cousin told me that uh, he encountered the person who had actually done that to him in town one day, but just was able to just let it go. Um, and you know, you, you just cannot imagine um, what that must have been like. Yeah, and of course, yourself and Erica are involved with the charity Handicap International, um, who um, make or donate prosthetics for amputees, you know, victims of this war. Yes, we, we got it. Yes, we, 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 we were involved with this charity and um, helped to build a center for making prosthetics um, mm -hmm. at, at that time. Yeah. Okay, and is this sort of historical experience, is it going to ever, are you going to respond to this in your practice, in your art practice? Are you going to make pieces that document this horrible period as a way to offer succor to people who have been victims, or in fact, even to reflect I, I, the, I, the narrative of lived experience of Sierra Leone? Yes, I, I, I think I, I think it's something that um, I, I will address. And um, it is actually something that when I was um, looking at images for this, for these paintings, it is something that I, I, I did actually look at. So um, it, it is something that I have uh, in the back of my mind. Beautiful. And then um, the other, you know, sort of horrendous experience of, um, you know, is Ebola. And I see, I don't see very much of that reflection in, in the work. Is that something also for the future? Again, I think it is. Uh, it, 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 it's the same thing. I mean, um, in fact, Khadija addressed this in her text that um, these, um, these are the two major um, events in Sierra Leone that caused so much um, disruption and um, uh, heartache. Um, but um, yes, it, it is definitely something that uh, will be addressed. Sure. And um, you've been in England since you were nine years old. Um, does the English countryside not um, interest you as a topic for um, a landscape painting? Uh, well, actually, my, my wife likes going for um, long walks in the countryside, and she often tries to drag me along. And um, <laughs> she, has, she has this trick of saying that, oh, it's, we're only going for one mile. And then you find five miles later you're still still walking. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I um, it, it doesn't um, it doesn't feature in my um, my paintings um, uh, yet. I would say um, I, I am um, I, I live I live in Bath, which is very close to very nice countryside. Um, but uh, so far, it's not something that I have wanted to paint. But I'm sure there will come a time when, when I will. Of course, yeah, at the right time, I'm sure. At the right time, yeah. Yes, indeed. So yourself and the family um, go to Sierra Leone regularly. And um, I see this is your um, Airbnb uh, accommodation. <laughs> no, I guess. Obey. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> Actually, no, no. Yes, th this is, this is uh, for Obey. This is one of the very old buildings um, on the on the campus, we we had been there looking around and um, uh, and uh, taking some photographs. And uh, uh, this is one of the lovely old buildings, um, which was so uh, full of character. And um, one of the themes of this exhibition is the um, uh, the 
the effects of the climate on on the on the um, landscape and on buildings um, because as you know we have a very heavy rain season and then we have um, uh, sunshine for six months or so of the year um, but the the effects uh, and the lack of maintenance um, mean that you get a lot of buildings actually um, deteriorate very 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 quickly um, and are often um, not not sort of looked after um, and so when when you're going and coming sort of back and forwards you you really notice um, the effects of this um, however having said that um, the people are very very resilient and um, uh, even though I, I mean I Perhaps if someone someone from the West was to visit, um, they they would perhaps go to some buildings or some houses and think, you know, how how on earth can a family live here? This house is not maintained. It, you know, they might they might think it looks dirty, but actually, the people who live there will keep it spotless, and you know, the place will be swept every day and be really clean, um, and and so on. And so it it, it um, that 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 was. I, I think maybe I'm sort of asking myself questions as I'm doing these paintings. Um, um, at the same time, there's the legacy of um, colonialism. We have yeah. these buildings that were built in the colonial era. Um, and um, yeah, so that's... <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's um, the resilience of the people that keeps them standing. You know, yes. they might not be pretty as they were the, the year they were built, but they are still as functional as... Yeah. the wear from that first year however as a painting i really love the blue and the greens that sky and how that really sets off the the foliage you know in the in behind the house as well as in fact it's just got such a soft feel looking at it on screen almost feels like a watercolor painting with some oil on canvas i've also yeah. looked very closely at some of your technique you use a lot of washes, so you use a very thin wash to get a um, effect of depth and you know, tonal gradation, which I think is really well done, um, and I really like it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I show I show another. I sh uh, let me quickly I'm just going to say as a so point that... of interest. Sorry, just as a point of interest, Iyame Day has told us that Fora Bay is older than Annie Walsh. Just ah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And and um, sorry, can I just ask you, Arthur? Can you just turn down your microphone just a little bit, please? Because I think you're getting some feedback. Sorry, is that better? Hopefully, we don't sometimes know until you're talking. So hopefully, that will do it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So this is the same sort of dilapidated, almost you know, sort of collapsed building, but that dilapidation is not an eyesore because it's in a painting. It almost looks quaint and you know, quite pleasant to look at as a painting. But if yes. you were, if you had to go into the building, then you would be maybe um, in shock or in, in awe as to how can this still be standing and people living in it. Yes. Um, so tell us about this piece. Well, this, this building actually was in um, a village called uh, Charlotte. And Frozen, I think. Uh, frozen. Is it me or is it him? No, you've frozen Arthur a little bit. So can I'm you frozen. Oh, sorry. Can you, can you yes. go back so to what we you were saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you start your answer again? The please? last thing we heard was the building's in Charlotte. That's the last thing I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yes. So it's in Charlotte. Charlotte is an old Creole um, uh, village, um, which was. Um, founded by or established by um, the freed slaves who um, returned to Sierra Leone. And um, uh, as Khadija wrote in, in the catalog, um, it, it was um, named after um, uh, Princess Charlotte, who was the daughter of um, George, I think George of King George IV. Um, and so, but these structures are still there and they were actually built by the freed slaves. Um, and you can, see, you can see that they have been patched up over time and so on, but the descendants um, of these freed slaves are still living there. 
So for me, when I when I saw these buildings, um, it, 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 I think it, you know it it it, it means. It means a great deal, actually. Um, uh, you know, it and it also made me think of, you know, the title, which was the um, postcards from a promised land, um, of of the the promises that were made to the um, freed slaves, and um, and just made me question whether um, whether those promises have actually been um, realised. So it has a its story set in slavery, yet the um, sort of uh, figuration or or, composite or subject matter of slavery is not directly there in your practice. Um, that is slavery is a history of Sierra Leone. Um, does it is it something also that you're going to be uh, you know en engaging on in time to come? So more um, directly. I, I, well, I, it, it's not. Um... I don't. It, it, it's an interesting one. Um, possibly, um, I, I I found the um, my visits to Ghana and visiting the uh, the slave forts, the existing slave forts in Ghana, um, incre incredibly powerful. Um, but I think that with the the history of Sierra Leone. Uh, and I, you know, I was reading about this and and about the Creoles and as Khadija's mentioned, um, Yamide um, is involved with a, uh, I think she has started a, or she started some time ago, a uh, society which actually keeps the traditions of the Creole people alive. Um, which is Creole .com. That's Creole.com. Well, right, okay. <laughs> and yeah. it's a fantastic, fantastic thing. And, um, uh, and, I, th I find that the history of Sierra Leone is incredible and um, perhaps not not well known. Um, uh, it, it, it is a really interesting story, and it, it's something that I'm certainly fascinated uh, in and want to look into more deeply. Sure. Yeah. Excellent. In the meantime, we enjoy this beautiful painting. Um, I noticed some of your work, like um, one of the pieces which had. Uh, was it had the water the waterfall uh, that one there? There were some techniques you used which I found quite fascinating. Of course, me in the days I used a brush as well. It almost seems sprayed, so the surf and all that it's so well, so delicately captured, right? And um, how have you achieved this effect? Is it brush work? It's not palette knife, that's for sure. Um, it, 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 it is brush work actually, has and, and sprayed it. sprayed from the brush. Um, I, I, I flicked, I, I actually flicked the brush sometimes with, with the, the paint on. Um, and, um, so you get, you get that sort of yeah. sense of movement as the yeah, paint okay. sort of yeah. slides along the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I, I experimented till I got a technique that seemed to work really. Yeah. Um, Very interesting. And these are the um, children, Eric, Charlotte, and, yes, um, no, no, uh, uh, Erica, Isabella, and um, Isabella Duval. and Duval. That's right. Yeah. Duval on the left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whilst whilst you're taking a slight pause, can I go to one of my favorite paintings? Oh, you're going to talk about Isabella's head start. That's exactly where I was leading. Okay, then I'm going to <laughs> then I'll ask you about to, another you... one afterwards to talk about. Okay, that. sure. <laughs> so, um, sorry about my failed effort to remember the children's names, but um, we no, 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 no. <laughs> now this is a landmark painting I was mentioning earlier, which is nearly six meters long by nearly two meters high. And it's in a not exceptionally large room, but it doesn't overwhelm the room. So please tell me the story, the beautiful story you told, I think I'm sure everybody else would like to hear about it, um, you know, about this painting, please. The story um, is that we were um, on holiday um, with the family and, um, uh, we decided to um, have a race uh, along the beach. Um, and uh, Erica uh, is the one who actually officiated and <laughs> was the one who started, started the race. Um, but before that, we, we um, decided that um, we would actually um, have a head start by age. So we gave Isabella a huge um, start, which I think must have been about 50 meters. 
and then um, Duval, because Duval was the um, second youngest. Um, so Duval was then given another uh, distance, maybe 25 meters or so. And then Miles was behind him. And then, then they, they put me back as far as they could. Um, and then, so Eric has started to race. Not quite enough. <laughs> Not quite far enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I was really a, a long, long way, way back. Um, and Eric had started the race. And so we all started and Isabella was kind of um, going from side to side and really running as fast as she could. Um, but Apparently she was four years old at the time. <laughs> she was. <laughs> I should be ashamed. I should be embarrassed, but I was. <laughs> but I, I was desperate to catch up, and um, so and 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 I did, and you know the boys as well. And um, when we overtook uh, Izzy, uh, she uh, she burst into tears, and we, <laughs> we had to comfort her. Um, yeah. 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 Where's everybody else on this beach? It seems there was so no one else. There was no one else there. This is the thing that you know. Um, it, it's possible in Sierra Leone to sometimes go to beaches um, when there's no one there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, um, obviously now it, it's probably different, but but um, I think if you go early, still there are some beaches where still mm. people aren't there. Yeah. But um, yeah, there, there is though. Um, there is an issue though of um, sort of um, uh, urban sprawl, a, a sort of encroachment. Um, and one of the problems is that um, if it, this is a, a sort of a sort of UNESCO um, heritage um, site, the, the forests behind in the peninsula, and the government um, are not really doing it enough to protect it, um, and that really is something that they need to preserve because you know if if they allow this to to be lost, it will be a real shame. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. So can we go to the, oh, okay, can we go to the place in the forest? The, the yes. place has a place in the forest. Whilst we're doing that, I'm just going to, um, Professor Wayne Dooling has just said there's a book if people are interested, The Creoles of Sierra Leone, published in 1974 by L. Spitzer, is a good history. So take okay. note of that, please, in the chapter. I noticed at the launch, um, Arthur, um, mm -hmm. You were probably doing, you're very good milling around, but I noticed as I listened to people, this is one of the paintings that really took people's breath away. So whoever's listening or seeing now, you may not get the, the, the glory of it all, which is why you have to go to the exhibition, but people were saying, this is the one I'm going to buy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really is so breathtaking and it's and it, it's got this combination of you're having these you know us as humans in this in this beautiful place but it just it takes you over nature takes you over in such an amazing yeah. way and, and this is really epitomizes that you know and and other people saying it just makes me want to go to Sierra Leone so I think that is one is a very breathtaking one I just wanted to to mention that and point that the out. The photograph yeah, doesn't do it justice at all. It doesn't, no. Because there's so many tones, so many graduations of color exactly. through that foliage, right? The Naples yellow, almost Naples, then as it graduates to the yellow, to the pinks, and then then goes on to the blues and then the the, the violets, you know, very, very light pastel looking colors. Yeah. Then the strength of the contrast between the jungle and then the greenery or the greenness of the river. You know, refle reflections yeah. of the sky and all that. It's um, impossible to see in this picture. You really need to see the exhibition, see this painting. Yeah. And just the way you can almost see, even though, you know, where the boat is and with them and the people, you can almost imagine how they've gone and glided in <laughs> and they're going to disappear into the forest. It's, ah, oh, it's great. O also for technique as well. I mean, this is yes. one of the ones where you use the paint very runny you know and then you kind of slap the brush around to create that um movement of the water um yes. you don't paint with a palette knife do you you just use your paint no i don't I, I i never use a palette yeah. knife no, it's okay like, you just use a paint thick at times such as in that um purple, yeah. purple um landscape in the in the foliage yes to suggest it. yeah it's yes. incredibly well done thank you i i i i found the the um the the, the foliage was really um sort of quite magical and um and mysterious and the um 
and also the, I think the scale with the people in the boat and yeah. this very dense um, vegetation. Um, yeah, it's a very limited palette. Yes. But there's, there's no shortage of depth in the effect that you've achieved but through the brush strokes because some of that foliage is defined by the brush stroke they cross the hatching of the brush rather yes. than the changing of the colors yes. so it's you could have the same color it's just the way the light hits the color it's as a result of the way the brush is inclined on the canvas mm. and that's that's beautifully done thank you nice uh, sorry, I'm I'm lost now. I don't know which way I'm navigating. I'm probably... sorry, I interrupted. Okay, so you. that's the one I was looking at. It's fine. <laughs> but that's I wanted to get that fine. in before we go to questions. So I'm just encouraging Indeed. people if they have questions, we will come to sure. your questions in a few minutes. So you know. So, so again, the way the horizon is rising from the bottom through in that golden sort of blend of colors of yellows and some. Um, light orange, you can just about see the orange through. You can see uh, the paintings achieved through a process of layering. So there's an underpainting and then there's paintings painted over it to create that three-dimensional effect of transition of color. And then as it goes, progresses beyond the, the, the foliage, the leaves, it then completely changes, the color scheme changes completely. It then becomes almost a dull, grayish, pinkish, um, almost off whitish combination. So that transition as it rises through from the depth of that purple at the bottom, the deep violets at the bottom, rise through to the gold and then back. It's just a good transition in my view. Is a transition I'd like to achieve in my own work. Okay, Can I just read out a little bit of a comment there? Somebody, we have John Okpalas, I mean, a lovely comment. I'll just read part of it if I, if I may. As an artist, I am impressed by the clarity of thought and craft that's gone into these paintings. Arthur's many years of architectural practice and expertise is very evident in the draftsmanship shown. The beautiful use of perspective, brushwork and color harmony is just wonderful. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a good. Thank I you. love the way it brings together so both of these art forms. That's a very nice thing. As, a, as an architect and as a painter, yeah. Yes, yeah. wonderful. Um, Again, these are you know, tropical landscapes with the same sort of um, dilapidated surroundings that don't look so pathetic to look at as a painting um, because it's beautifully uh, rendered. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to um, open for questions soon. So I don't know if um, before I do, if I know Arthur, you want you had some other. Yes, I I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yes, I, I actually I wanted to to ask you, Hassan, actually about um, okay. about your experiences, um, yes. because I, I know that you you have been an artist for a very long time, um, you know. Whereas I, I'm just really a newcomer. Um, so I, I really wanted to ask you about your experiences and and to. Um, to ask you about some of the obstacles that um, that you think actually exist uh, or things that you've experienced um, uh, as you sure. as so you... I, I went to art school yeah. I went to art school in Nigeria I graduated in 1986 from fine art at Amolibudi University in Zaria as the best fine art year student I graduated I've lost yeah I think we've just got you back. No. Sorry. Is just it me? Hello? Uh, Hassan, I think, it, is that me or is that? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. We've got okay, you sure. back. So yeah. I don't know how much you heard, but I'm not going to go over it. So, oh, I see, I beg your pardon, my, my internet connection has been unstable. Okay, so shortly after graduation, I set up my studio in Lagos. Back then in 1987, there weren't any galleries in Lagos, any commercial galleries. Uh, you could show in the, any one of a number of um, foreign um, cultural missions, uh, the US Information Center, Goethe Institute, French Cultural Center, sometimes the British Council. And then of course the National Museum and the National Gallery, uh, maybe some hotels like Sheraton. There was, those were the places where we, we could show our work. 
I was very active. I shoot my work very um, regularly in Lagos. And in, in the in late 80s, uh, when the uh, Soviet Cultural Center opened up in Nigeria following Glasnost and Perestroika. So basically when the Soviet Union, USSR, decided to have cultural affiliations with other countries in the world, rather than be a pariah, pariah nation on its own, um, effectively, um, I was the first artist to exhibit at the new Soviet Cultural Center in Lagos, which was very well attended by government and diplomatic corps and all that. So I came to London on invitation by an artist who was based here at the time uh, called um, Emmanuel Jegede. He invited me to come and have a show with him here. I'd been born in London. I'd gone back to Nigeria following the unfortunate events of you know, having to be sent home uh, yeah. Yeah. because of you know, circumstance of you know, living circumstances of my parents back in the 60s. Um, when I came back, by the time I came back, I had been quite an experienced artist. But one thing I noticed was that I was being categorized. For the first time, I suddenly found myself as a black artist and belonging in this category called black art, which wasn't hitherto where I would categorize or define myself. I had to redefine myself. I had to start my career from scratch. I moved from one studio to another. I am um, set up, I worked for um, in the in the black art space, initially working as, you know, helping out with some curation, the um, uh, the Caribbean craft circle in Shepherd's Bush in London. Uh, subsequently, um, I worked as curator of the One Eye Gallery from 1992 to 1996. In 97, I set up the Norwood Art House with Raymond Watson, son of Barrington Watson, whose brother, Raymond, whose brother did the uh, recent, uh, the Windrush um, monument in, in Waterloo. Um, but I always had my studio. I did a number of commercial work. I have illustrated, my work has been used as illustrations for a good number of um, Heinemann African Writer Series titles, including a few of Amata Aidu's, the Ghanaian writer, as well as a number of others. Um, I run my studio in Raynham, Essex, and I also have a private gallery where I show my work as well as I represent the Nigeria Art Society of which I am the founding president. Um, we have exhibitions all over the world. Our current touring exhibition is titled Legacies of Biafra. It originated in 2018 at Brunei Gallery in London and has recently shown at uh, Gallery Oldham. It's intended to go to Ivaleva House in Bayreuth. Um, that tour schedule has been disrupted by COVID, but we're still talking about doing it sometime soon in the very near future. Um, I do a lot of commission work. I work for a whole pile of people and paint all kinds of things. So I've got two trends to my work myself initiated work and the work that a commissioner would ask me to make for them. Um, yeah, so that's essentially my story. Um, the art and the, the, so the attitude towards the art that we make has transformed quite significantly in the last decade, decade and a half, in fact, maybe two decades since globalization, since um, the GT Bank of Nigeria sort of um, activated the whole, your idea of collecting in by public institutions such as the Tate Modern or the Tate generally in, in the UK. Um, there's been a lot more sort of you know, engagement by the private art gallery sector, as well as the new art fairs that you find, you know, dotted around the world. So um, there's been a lot of visibility on work by non, you know, British, English, white artists uh, in London and, you know, in the metropoles of, you know, the art world generally. Uh, but yeah, that's that's up to now, unless you want to say a lot more. There's a lot more to say, but um, it's not about me, is it? It's your conversation. No, no, no. I, 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 I'm really interested in, and, and thank you for, for giving that background, actually, because I, I was looking at your work and um, I, I really like the techniques that you use with um, uh, thank you. Your, um, the, the way that, uh, in fact, th there was one title of one of your your pictures that um, okay. I think we, we almost share the same title because Oh, which one? Uh, yours was, um, I think it was The Good Ship. Um, oh, yes, yes. Uh, and I, I did a painting which I called The, the Good Ship and the Oriel, which was related. Right. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You saw, yeah. how excited I you saw how excited I got when you mentioned yes. the Oriel. I nearly jumped out <laughs> yes, was and I nearly jumped out because I'm working on a project. As a matter of fact, um, I was on a conference with um, Khadija the um, Biennale, the, the Biennale Conference of the Association, African Studies Association at the University of Liverpool in yeah. September. 
and there was a lot of talking about the Oreo. It's a project that I was, we, uh, Louis, Dr. Luisa Egbonike and myself, we've been talking about for a few years because in the whole conversation around Windrush, it's almost on the periphery of that conversation, the fact that Africans also contributed in helping um, Britain to recover from the post-war um, destruction and recovery, you know. So the, the people who came from Africa, they just didn't come on the empire windrush. And so therefore they've sort of been sidelined in the corridors in the passage of history. Um, and we wanted to revive that conversation, but a passage on the good ship is um, a remake of a painting I did in 1993. Um, and the painting was called uh, Flight of the Maroon. It was look, it's really based on the theme of slavery but then the passage on the good ship was also based on the theme of Brexit. And my fear for um, the so maybe revival, if you like, of um, the antagonism of the, of the settler who's come, who has migrated to live in the UK, because it was all about otherness, right? And, and I found that that sort of um, narrative around Brexit was just so strong that I felt uncomfortable. Many people, um, many Africans and migrants have come to the UK, didn't vote for Brexit for the very reason that they thought it had a racial agenda to it that might be detrimental to them. So that was what you know, sort of spurred that painting, the good ship, the passage on the good ship. Mm. But um, um, also, I'm also doing a doctorate. I'm in my fourth year on a doctorate. And I'm looking at the subject, the topic of um, anti-black violence. And so that's where that comes from. That, that theme comes from, mm -hmm. as well as the themes of war, displacement, and of um, expulsions and deportations of by one African country of another country's nationals. So that's yeah, why it's, I was, um, it's fascinating. And and also, the, I, I noticed that your 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 style it it, it really it is reminiscent of the of the Italian futurism. And um, that's right. I, I I can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, sorry, my um, earpods have just died, as I feared. So I'm going to try to turn, I'm going to turn my um, audio to the laptop, which might echo a bit, which is what we're trying to avoid. But bear with me a sec so I can discuss that. Whilst you're doing that, I'm going to ask um, Arthur a question that we've got here. Oh, I'll just respond to one of the questions. Somebody has asked when this conversation will be available. It will be online with SOAS in about a week, but it will also... I think will be on the site with gallery 19572. So this will be available. And, and the text that I've written, you think we've covered a lot this evening? Yeah, there's more. <laughs> you know, I talk about things from a different, slightly different angle, but maybe what they've discussed this evening, and that will be available in the catalog that will be available in January. So that is an answer to that question. Um, are you are you ready, Hassan? Or yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. So, in terms of in terms of technique, when I went to university in 1981, um, Nigeria was going through the structural adjustment program. We had just had the oil glut, and there was just about the same man who's president of Nigeria now was president then, and um, he basically he um, embargoed the importation of art materials. And as a result, artists had to find other materials to work with. Some artists decided to use burnt wood, so they would take a piece of board and take a candle to it and make their images, score out a few parts of it. You know, that innovation and, and you know, became a norm, if you like. You know, people went back to traditional art uh, materials, such as making works with beadwork, painting with beadwork, with, um, fabrics, you know, um, and a whole range of stuff. At the time I painted with this category known as essential commodities. These were the only consumer products that were not embargoed. And they typically were imports from Tate and Lyle, from Cadbury's, you know, the companies, the colonial, you know, conglomerates who had been, um, you know, sort of shipping their products out to Africa as a way to sort of, you know, for, for the market, if you see what I'm saying. So, but the, the packaging that those products came in were brightly colored. So I started to do the work with collage. So a lot of the work I made over the years were either with collage or with a self-tempered paint. The paint, which I used back then was a powder pink pigment that was offered by UNESCO 
to early years education. So it was given to primary schools, you know, as aid, whatever. And we went to the markets where surplus, or in fact, maybe even the entire consignment was available to be to be sold. And we bought these powder pigments and put punal glue, which was a locally produced glue in Nigeria, it's like a PVA, into that and mixed it and made our paintings with it. Where we didn't have brushes, we painted with sticks, we painted with palette knives, we painted with knives which we fabricated by ourselves. So to a large extent, my painting techniques are derived from the reality of that experience at the time when I went to school, to uni. Uh, when I had the opportunity to paint with the brush on canvas, which was much, much later on, uh, after I had graduated, uh, again, that's when figuration really came into my work. I did figuration for a long while, and I've kind of moved into a blend between abstraction and figuration now. Thank you. I've got a few questions for Arthur, but I'm going to get those now before we finish. Um, again, from uh, John Akpala. First, let, let me congratulate Arthur on his work. I'd like to ask him how he decides on his subject matter and how he collects reference material. Additionally, I'm curious about how long it takes him to complete each canvas and how he determines the scale of each subject. Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, 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 I tend to, the subject matter, um, I tend to choose on the basis of, um, uh, you know, if, if um, I, uh, first of all, I, I have used um, photographs, I've used uh, family photographs, or, old photographs initially from um, my um, my late father's photographs which um, we, we found you know after he, he passed and then family photographs that we've taken on holidays um, and um, but I, I tend to uh, do paintings from just images that I find really um, just you know visually arresting things that interest me that I'm curious about. Sometimes I think that with um, photographs, you, you can capture a very special moment um, that can translate very well into a painting. Um, and as you're actually doing it, um, it, can move, it can move away from that. Um, and, and in a way, that's really where um, I think something magical happens. And um, in terms of the scale, um, I mean, I have found that um, initially when I, I, my canvases were quite small and when you suddenly move to a large canvas, um, there was a kind of difficulty in uh, the technique um, that I was using. Um, but the more I started working on the larger canvases, um, I've sort of um, become accustomed to it now. So I'm much more used to it. I mean, previously, I, I, you know, if you said to me a few years ago that, you would do a painting that is almost, you know, two meters by two meters. I would have um, uh, just, you know, thought you were joking or something. But <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now I've, I, I've, I've actually done it, and um, uh, um, you know, I'm quite reasonably pleased, quite pleased with the results. So, um, so yeah, that's that's really how I think. Um, but generally, I select images that just appeal to me. Um, and perhaps um, sometimes you, you have um, images that can convey a, a certain um, mood or feeling and um, you try to want to emulate that. Okay, <laughs> got another couple of questions for you here. One of them, um, I don't have a name of the person, they're remaining anonymous. How is longevity viewed in an artist's career? And does that determine how their work is seen by gatekeepers of the art world? Maybe it'd be good if both of you gave a brief answer. I'm saying brief because I'm looking at the time. <laughs> yeah, well, well I, 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 as for longevity, um, I'm, I'm actually a new kid on the block. So, <laughs> well, uh, maybe not kid, but um, I, I, uh, it, it, it is something that um, uh, I, has come to me sort of late, I would say. Um, um, although I, I have made some progress in the last few years. Um, I think that, that I think that there's, from what I know, um, and I'm finding out, I think that there are issues with the gatekeepers, so to speak. Um, and um, I read a little bit about the history, and um, and the way that institutions um, 
uh, have been uh, a bit um, coy or reluctant to embrace um, art by um, artists of color. Um, part of it seems to be uh, sometimes because it does not conform to the sort of Western um, canon or that they're also, they're not able to, to really understand um, what artists are trying to convey. Um, and I think perhaps it should be more their duty to really make sure that um, they do that. I think that people in the museums and the art, these um, major art galleries should really be uh, engaging a lot more. Um, I don't think it should be all, all a question of um, that art from um, artists of color should conform necessarily to the way um, the sort of um, Western canon has, has always been. Um, in other words, by that I mean that they, they allude to a certain standard and because they do not understand some of this work, um, that sort of work does not necessarily get exhibited. And so I think that they need to um, find a way to engage with that more. I know that there are very prominent, incredibly well-established um, black artists who um, uh, you know, are, are exhibited widely and are in museums and galleries and so forth. But um, it was very interesting for me to hear Hassan's experience as an artist who has been going for a very long time and um, uh, you know, to see what, what he has encountered. And um, probably at this point, I should let Hassan um, speak because he knows much more about this than I do. Well, in terms of long longevity, I think I see my art as being my life. It's not a job. It's something that I will continue to do and I will have to leave to support doing all the other things I need to do. Just make sure that I keep making the work. That's the first, I have a commitment to the art. Um, that's the first thing. My art wants to say things about life, about the world of my experience, about my history, my family, and um, wants to educate and to set the record straight in many cases. Um, it's a labor of love and it's a deep love. So it's something that would remain, I would continue to do. It's not something that I'm going to say suddenly, okay, I'm going to stop painting by the time I'm when I retire and then that's it. I don't think artists ever retire. I think you just make work until physically you're not able to continue to make the work or maybe something you know, sort of prohibits you from continuing to make. Yeah, I mean, the artist who does that, I should say, yes, you can show your commitment. There you are sitting in your studio, freezing, but you're committed to the art. So being that cold, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. you're sitting there. Yeah. But it's the same with the artist, um, and I keep forgetting the artist's name, but he is still making work conceptually, even though he is he is he's disabled. And this is the Nigerian artist name who I'm thinking of. Uh, Yinka Shonibari. Exactly. Yinka yes. is still doing it. He's still doing the work and he will still get out and about to spaces. Absolutely. But, it, but his, his, his body will not, he's not letting, you know, his, his body that is not working, not allow him to make work or not no, comment on work. nothing is stopping him at all. Nothing is yeah. stopping him. Yeah. yeah, 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 totally amazing. I, I have another question here, which is for both of you too. We will probably end on this one. It's a very interesting question from Huda Mustafa. Has anyone written about those strategies that you've just talked about creating art materials and tools? I saw that question and I thought because it came around about 6.30 there about when I was speaking. So I thought it might be addressed to me. <laughs> and um, I think both of you can answer. I, I, I think it's... I think this is one for Hassan, actually. <laughs> so, yes. So in terms of, you know, the work of El Natsui, he uses yeah. bottle tops to make such brilliant, you know, sculpture. And um, the work of Bruce Onobakweya, he invented the plastic cast technique that he, use, that he makes his work with. He uses Araldite Rapid, which is not a conventional art material to make a low relief from which he etches, right? Ingenious work. Um, there's many, many people working in that sort of realm, reinterpreting non-conventional, non-standard art materials to make art as a result of the reality of the time or the economy or whatever other factor that deemed it necessary. I mean, yam print was a very common and popular technique of printmaking when I was growing up. And many people up to this day still make prints from yam, 
the sort of etch on the yam, put some paint on it, and then they print it out on paper. So um, there is a lot that's been written. There isn't one sort of compendium of alternative approaches to making art, if that's what you're asking. I certainly, I document my process. It's part of the doctorate I'm doing at the moment, showing where exactly it is, you know, within my practice, how that economic reality has translated into a new form of artistic expression. So that writing, that written work is done. And I'm sure I can pass some of that information to Khadija subsequently, and she might be able to distribute to you. Thank you. Okay, I hope, thank uh, you. I hope my answer is sufficient. Yes, wonderful. Um, and it, that ended uh, just a nice point because I've got two lovely comments here that we're going to end on in the chat. And I'm going to just thank you all for being here and participating. So from Dotton, um, we have a message. I find, I'm sorry, Dotton, I don't know how to pronounce your surname properly, but I'll try Dotton Adegbute. I find the painting style interestingly unique. Though oil is a medium, you also get the feel of watercolor, giving the style a hybrid effect. I totally agree. Yeah, and, and that's so obvious in some of the paintings. It's, it's, it's amazing, yeah. Um, and it's from um, Adama Munu. It's so lovely to see the beauty of Sierra Leone's landscapes and histories portrayed in this way. It's very rare to see. So many congrats to Arthur. And I think all of our congrats go to you, Arthur. I mean, so much. This, third, this third collection is just yeah. is beautiful and amazing. I'm reminding people it is at Gallery 1957. In, um, in Hyde Park Gate. I put the details in the chat for people. You have until January the 28th. You can get a copy of the of this uh, discussion if you would like to share it with, with people. It will be on the SOAS website. Um, maybe uh, Professor Wayne Dooling can tell us maybe where on the website it, it is because it's a big website. And, um, and also it will be one, Gallery 1957 will also have a copy of that. Um, Hassan, thank you so much for engaging Arthur in this conversation and sharing your wealth of knowledge. Arthur, thank you, thank you for, for sharing to, you know, thank bringing you. It alive a little bit your, your collection online to share with people. That's great, especially people who are abroad. And thank you everybody for coming too. So Professor Dooling, perhaps you'd like to sign us out. And that's all. No, I don't have anything to add, but thank you very much to everybody for attending, and thank you very much to our speakers for giving us an incredibly interesting uh, conversation this evening, and of course the wonderful images that we uh, saw. Uh, congratulations again, um, Arthur, and um, I should say thank you to everybody, and have a good evening, and stay warm, I guess. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.